Well, good morning again. Thank you for uh, being here. It's a special week. It really, really is. Uh, because this is the week in our series where we get to hear a lot of your stories as well. And I'm excited to read some of them um, that I, I picked out. But before we get there, I just want to make sure that we cover, you know, especially if you're new here today, just where we've been um, in this series. So the first week was all about Paul and Silas and everything that they went through in their life for Christ. Right? We saw how they suffered at times. We saw how they were thrown in prison after being beaten. And what do they do? They sing. They praise God in the midst of whatever storm uh, that they were going through. And again, what gives me such great uh, encouragement in that story is knowing that each one of us, right, we all go through something in life where we feel like we are in the pits, right? There's something going on where maybe we feel like God is not using us. And we go back to this story and we see how God, he had Paul and Silas exactly where he wanted them. Yeah, I was in prison, but guess what happened? A jailer came to faith. A whole family was baptized. Who knows what happened to the prisoners who were all around hearing them praise God. So as we go through storms in our life, let's keep doing the same thing. Let's keep that perspective that God is using every circumstance that he calls us into. And it may be the people around us who are getting fed in their faith by our big faith. Week two is all about Lazarus and really the, the sisters of Lazarus as well, Mary and Martha, as we saw how Jesus, he has the power to raise anyone from the dead, that he truly is the son of God and the resurrection really belongs to him. Uh, we talked about middle words that day, middle words and final words. We got that idea from the National Youth Gathering this summer. And the middle words are things in life that try to define who you are, that try to tell you this is your identity. Middle words are things like anxiety, inadequacy, death even. And we heard that no final words are the ones that God gives us. That's the identity that we have as the redeemed, as having this peace about the hope of the resurrection, knowing that someday it's going to happen for each and every one of us. That was week two. Moving on into week three, we looked at the story of David and Goliath. I had fun with that one just because we don't usually preach on that. Usually it's in Sunday school, but for some reason we don't usually cover that story uh, up here. But we talked about all the giants that we face in life, how David, he took his shot of big faith against Goliath, trusting in the power of God that he would be with him as he faced this adversary, but also how Jesus took his shot for us on the cross and how that rock of faith is something that he's given us, that because of his death and his resurrection, we have the faith that we have, and we know that the final word is one of forgiveness. And then the fourth week, we looked at a character more than really a story. It was the character of Rahab, set in the context of the book of Joshua and the, the walls of Jericho and everything that happened to Rahab. And we talked about how God, he's willing to use anyone in this life. No one is too far gone from God's grace, from it reaching out and telling them that they matter, that I can use you, that I want you to be part of my family. And so we got to see that and... Uh, know that God, he really does gather all of us into his family. Then last week, Abraham and Isaac, that was our story. And I don't know about you, I, I've read that story many times, but every time I read it, until I get to the end, I get that anxiety still because you read about a father taking his only son, Isaac, up a mountain. And the Lord has asked him to, to offer him as a burnt sacrifice. It doesn't sit well, does it? Until you get to the end and you see what God had planned all along. It was a test of Abraham's faith. And God, he does test us in this life. We do go through seasons where he's trying to grow our faith. He's seeing where we're going to turn to. And God, that whole thing of testing and temptation, God, he tests us to draw us closer to him. And then in temptation, that's what the devil uses to try to draw us away from God. So very two distinct things there. But we saw how the really perfect Jesus, he takes the place of the really guilty, meaning us, and that sacrifice for us, knowing that that all results in a real redemption, knowing for certain that the tomb is empty and that death and sin are defeated. See, God's love, when it was put to the test, it proves that he loves us unconditionally again and again and again as we read that story. And that all leads us into this week, your big faith stories. And I could have taken all of them, but we'd be here till about three o'clock. 
I promise. <laughs> there was a lot that came in online. There was a lot that were posted out on the wall in our community center. And I just want to say, if you didn't get a chance and you'd like for those stories to be put in this little booklet that we're going to make and send out to you guys, probably via email. You still have time this week to do that. If you'll just email me, I will make sure those get put. We'll keep it anonymous, so don't let that be your hang-up. Uh, I pray that you, uh, you'll send some of those. But here's the first one. Here's the first big face story that um, I read. It says, many times in my life, my faith has been tested, challenged even. I've stood in the face of adversity. I've questioned God's will and plan for my life. You ever been there where you didn't trust God's will? We thought maybe, yeah, hey, God, I think I know what I need to do here. It's hard sometimes. Let's be honest, right? It's hard to always have that big faith and trust in God's will. But I like this next sentence. But time and time again, I have seen the goodness of God's plan. I've seen how it's worked out in my own life. That was one of the stories. Here's, here's one. Moving to Texas with my parents, it took big faith. Because it turned out the house loan my parents were hoping for, it didn't translate to Texas. We ended up staying in an extended stay hotel for about a month before we could find somewhere to rent. The promise of my dad's new job wasn't fully given, so my mom and I, we had to find a job quicker than anticipated. God stepped in. He sent generous people who let us borrow money without even asking. It was because of those generous people that we were able to move into a rental. God, he stepped in and saved that rental, rental for us because it was having a hard time being rented, so they dropped the price a little bit. The day they decided to drop the price was the day that we happened to step in as a family and was able to rent this unit. God, he stepped in and he allowed my sister to even enroll in a high school while still being categorized as homeless. God stepped in and he allowed this rental to be in the right zone for her to continue going to that new high school even. God, he was always moving behind the scenes for our benefit. All I can say is that God is so good. He loves his children and he's still moving on our behalf in this day and age. Our move to Texas would not have happened without God stepping in. Thank you for loving me, choosing me, and rewriting my story. God, he's written, rewritten every one of our stories. You know why I'm so thankful for this story? Because it's had an impact on every single one of your stories as well. Without God working behind the scenes, I don't know if we have our director of music, Melody, here with us today. That was her big faith story. So praise God. He knew that she would be used here in a pretty mighty way. So I'm, I'm thankful that uh, God, he was working behind the scenes that entire time. Here's one. Uh, big faith doesn't always show itself when we're going through hard times. In real life, we most often see big faith moments most clearly in retrospect when we look back on them. It's then that we realize God's faithfulness to us. I'm fortunate that God, he knows my heart because my head often leads me against what I know to be right. My big faith moments lately are during confession and absolution during church. If it weren't for the grace of Jesus, I believe I would not be here today. Thank you for this big faith series. And what's really cool about this big faith story is we come here, right? And we go through that, that confession and absolution. It does take big faith, right? To open up to God, to be fully exposed to God where he knows everything about us. It's not like we could ever hide anything anyways. But when we have that thought, right, we have two options, to either run from God or to fully be exposed, but to receive that forgiveness. So thank you for sharing that one. That, that does take big faith in, in that moment. This is from a mom. It says, I didn't grow up in church, but still had strong faith. I didn't pray much growing up. I didn't know how. I did always know I wanted to be a mom, and it's the only thing I've really prayed for. After several years of trying, I got a sign that it would happen, and guess what? It did. I thank God he works through signs, right, when we, when we look for them. We had a rough pregnancy, but I never lost faith. Now I have a healthy nine-year-old who has such a strong faith, and I know I am blessed. Parenthood in general takes big faith, doesn't it? Yeah. Here's the last one that I want to share with you today. Uh, that was written down. It's kind of a longer one, but I think it's, it's really, really good. In 2009, my wife and I decided to focus on missions in our early 50s, so I quit my job and we enrolled in a five-month missionary school with youth with a mission. That's an organization. 
They have over a thousand bases there, and there were countless school opportunities across the globe. We decided on Australia because it was a long way from the house with less distractions, right? We were excited, it says. The school consisted of three months of lectures and study, two months of practical work and outreach mission. And during the lecture phase of the leadership, the students prayed and decided to go to Bali and focus on the evangelizing because of the strong Muslim and Hindu influence there. And then on January 12, 2010, Haiti experienced a 7.0 earthquake that killed over 220,000 people. This organization that had about a base uh, about 50 miles north of that epicenter of that earthquake. And it sent out messages worldwide asking for prayers as they helped figure out how they could help the survivors. The leaders, staff, and students of the, that Australia base prayed every day for Haiti. About two weeks after the earthquake, my wife and another lady and I, we talked about how we could help Haiti. After praying, we felt called to go and that to be our base as our outreach mission. We presented that to our staff, but they felt strongly that we should go to Bali. We continued to pray and concluded that we had to go to Haiti, even if it meant that our leadership would drop us from the school and not recognize that we suc successfully completed the course. A big faith miracle came in that, that the outreach, outreach team from a base in Brazil that we know well was sending a team to Brazil the exact same date that we were to leave for the outreach. The leaders from the both bases finally agreed to allow us to join the team from Brazil to do our outreach in Haiti. So big faith, it got us to Haiti. And we knew it would be different. We knew it would be difficult, but we never dreamed of how hard it could be. We had traded the beaches of Bali for living in a two-person camping tent with over 100 degree weather, surrounded by death and displaced Haitians that had lost everything. On our 50 mile trip to base, we drove by mass graves. The smell of death was everywhere. Over 225 volunteers showed up to a base equipped only to handle 50. Every day, it seemed like five steps forward and four steps back. For much of the two months, we were sick, tired, and hot. Initially, the Haitian refugees we worked with hated us and wanted only handouts. They were broken and helpless, but our big God gave us big faith to serve and shine his light every day to these people. As time went on, the refugees shared their stories of loss and allowed us to minister to their emotional and spiritual needs. God showed up in the form of Bible studies and working along several local ministers to help. As we boarded the plane after two months, happy to be leaving Haiti, but also understanding that God had a plan for us. It wasn't white sand beaches, but it was getting big faith to a broken place to live with hopeless people, and to live a life that begged the question. So what do you think about when I read these stories? What do you hear? Yeah, inspiration for sure. I hear the stories that we read in the Bible as well. I hear giants <laughs> that rear their head up, try to get in our way. I hear of death, like Lazarus, and getting hope into the mission field, to people who are broken and hopeless. I hear of people who need grace, like Rahab. I hear of sacrifice, like Abraham. You see, God, he's working in my story, in your story, every story of the Bible. He's connecting for a greater purpose. And sometimes we get to pull back the curtain and see that when we share these stories together. How amazing is that? I have one more story that I want to share with you, only this one comes to us by way of video. Let's go ahead and take a look. Hey, Good Shepherd, we are in the middle of a sermon series this summer talking about big faith, and we've been highlighting some awesome big faith stories from characters in the Bible. But we want to take that next step as a church and think about our big faith stories and how we can share those and how our big faith stories inspire the body of Christ, even still today, to grow in their faith. So I want to share my big faith story to, to help get that ball rolling. And uh, to do that, I want to take us back to my senior year of high school. I was, I was 17 years old and I was, I was riding high 
uh, I'd been playing football. I was doing some awesome music stuff, uh, really involved with church. Um, my mom was the, the youth leader at church. Give you a little context there. Uh, we had two DCEs on staff when I was growing up, and, and they both left within about six months of each other to go to different churches or to pursue different opportunities. And uh, my mom stepped in to, to take that on uh, to help serve the church and to serve our youth. And so she and I got to work really closely together doing some awesome youth ministry things. And uh, man, it was it was awesome. My senior year, I had, I had so much going for me until we, we noticed that my dad had a, a lump on the side of his neck that was, it was kind of gnarly and we didn't really know what it was. So we went to one doctor's appointment and two and three and four. And after a while, we lost count of the number of doctors that my dad had seen trying to figure out what was going on with his neck. And one doctor finally said, you know, we, we ought to get a biopsy. So they did. And a couple of days before Christmas, we got the call from that doctor who said, you know, it's, it's cancer. And the prognosis was not, not good, not good at all. In fact, by the numbers, he said that my dad had a 10% chance to live four years. And like I said, right before Christmas, that was a gut punch that, that put a damper on that whole Christmas season for us. And uh, we, stuck, we, we did what we could. We took things in stride. Uh, we, we figured out, you know, what, what are the treatment options? What, what does it take? How do we get to take care of dad? And in the midst of all of this, my mom, like I said, working youth ministry at the church, but she was only 30 hours a week and she did not get the insurance benefits because she wasn't considered full time. So she walked into the pastors and, and laid everything out for them and said, here's the deal. I need to be bumped up that two extra hours to 32 to be considered full time. I need the benefits. I need the insurance covered. Uh, because at the time, everything that she was paying for insurance was coming out of her paycheck. And uh, the pastors looked at her and said, that's not the route we're going to go. Instead of taking you full time, we're actually going to let you go. And we're going to bring in an intern to replace you. And I will tell you the thoughts that I had about God and his church in those moments. They weren't good. I mean, I was hurt. I was devastated. I looked at a church that's supposed to reflect the image of God and show his love to the world. And I felt so betrayed and so angry and so sad that I wasn't sure I ever wanted to be a part of a church again. I, I was ready to walk away and be done. In fact, I remember a cold, wintry night looking up at the sky full of stars and, and just this bright and beautiful moment and telling God off that I was done. Obviously, that's not the end of my story. No, God continued to work in my life. For me personally, it was a couple of friends from youth group who dragged me back to church kicking and screaming. But the family stuff also worked. See, mom started looking for other jobs and she got one eventually that landed her as the coordinator of campus events at Concordia University, Chicago. That job opportunity meant not only was she full-time and got benefits, but my tuition was covered to go to Concordia. I knew I wanted to, to get into youth ministry and Concordia opened the door for me to get a degree to be a DCE, a director of Christian education, to continue doing the youth ministry that I fell in love with back at high school because I got to work with mom. You want to talk about miracles? God's story wasn't done for my dad either. Remember, 10% chance of living four years. We're coming up on 15 years and dad is still alive and kicking and he has been cancer free for the last 10 years or so. Miracles on miracles on miracles. God's story is still at work in my life. My big faith story holds only because I can look back and see how God was faithful to his promises. And I know that anything that comes up in my life, God is going to be faithful because he always has been faithful. Not just to some characters that happened way back in the Bible, but in my life, God has been faithful. And that's incredible. 
I think everybody has a big faith story, whether they know it or not, God is at work in your life. So I'd encourage you as we dig more and more into this big faith series to think about your life and to think about how God is at work in your story, write it down, remember it, refine it so that you are ready to share how God is at work in your life. One of the things that that I love about Good Shepherd is this heart that we have that says, be prepared to answer the question. What question? The question that your life asks. The question about what is that hope that you have? How can you have that hope? Writing this down helps you to be ready to answer that question when somebody asks. Writing that down also allows you to share and to build up this body of Christ here right now. And one of the ways that we can share these stories over in the community center, we've got that big white wall set up where you can tape your stories up and we would love to get to to read your stories and to know how God is at work in your life. And, And if you're like me and maybe your handwriting is questionable, There are other options. You can go on our website and uh, feel free to type in your big faith story. We want to know how God is at work in your lives so that one, you are built up and equipped to share how God is working in your life for somebody who asks that question. And two, we can build up the body of Christ here because we know that God is writing his story here and, and your story and my story and the stories of this whole church body make up the story that is Good Shepherd, that the story that God is writing here. And man, we are, we are so excited to see how the story continues to unfold. I'm very thankful for that man you see on the screen and everything that he's brought here to Good Shepherd. If you don't know, that's Seth Illick, our Director of Christian Education. But I asked Seth if I could finish that story a little bit because uh, he's had some big faith moments since being here as well. You know, we, we called Seth to come and serve here. Uh, he moved down here in September of 2020, uh, got installed in October of 2020 as well. His parents sat right over here, mom and dad, and uh, watched their son. It's not easy to, to leave where you've grown up your whole life. Uh, parents are in, were in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Emily's parents were in Michigan and moved all the way down south to Texas. So that took big faith. But in January of 2021, Seth got a call that his mom had passed. And, you know, that is a hard call to receive. I mean, many of you have received it. Many of you have been there by the bedside of your loved ones when they've gone. Those are big faith moments, aren't they? But I hope you take some inspiration away from that video because what happened since then has been a big faith story as well. And we even have Seth's dad as a part of our congregation now. He moved down here just to be close to his, his son and uh, to join a family of faith like Good Shepherd. So uh, it's pretty incredible how God's still working all around us and uh, accomplishing his will. So those are some of our big faith stories. And I know there are plenty more, and I encourage you to take the time to use this as a devotional tool, maybe, as you go about your weeks and your months, as you reflect on this series, to take time to write down how God has been faithful to you, to talk about uh, your prayer life, right, and see how God has been faithful to that, what doors he's opened, what doors he's closed. But I think it's an important thing that we do. Big faith, we've seen it in the stories of the past. In God's word. We've seen it in the stories of all of you. And there's so many stories I know that we could, we could share as well. But there's one other thing that we have to talk about today. What about our story? What about Good Shepherd's story? The big faith that we as a church have. You know, 11 years ago, uh, we were challenged to put on a production called Follow the Star. Right? We're entering into our second decade of this production. Do you realize that? This year being the 11th year. And I'm so excited that that is a fabric of who we are because we get so many people on our campus for three nights out of the year. They get to connect the, the dots through this life-changing production that shows scenes from Christ's life, right? That at Christmas time, we're not just looking at a baby in a manger, but we're looking at a man on a cross, and we're looking at an empty tomb. We're looking at a resurrected king, and then it all circles back to that Christmas present scene where we see a modern-day family reading the story of Luke 2. I say all this because that is 
something that some people thought that we'd never be able to do. It takes too much money. It takes too much time. It takes too much resources. But here we are. And we've seen the goodness of God come out of that production. Every year, stories, lives that are changed, baptisms that have happened because of it. And it's all because God's word was getting out to our community. And that's important. And as I said, our follow the star is always going to be a, a fabric of who we are here at Good Shepherd. But it can't be the only thing, right? Yes, three nights out of the year, we get to gather and give that gift back to the community. But here's the question I pose to all of you today. What if we got curious about where God is leading us into the future? How many of you know that next year, next October, we celebrate 50 years here at Good Shepherd. Guess what? Next October, we're running a lot of hands. So next October, we're celebrating 50 years here at Good Shepherd. What's the next 50 going to look like? What are we going to do to reach our community, to have follow the star every day of the year? I don't mean the production, guys. <laughs> I mean getting people on our campus, having something here that people come to, to do life with one another, to gather, to have fellowship with one another, to the moment someone steps into our building, to it scream out that kids count here, that our youth count here, that the next generation of Christians are being reached. What are we going to do? Before I, I go on, I want to set this up by kind of letting you know what God's doing in our area first. And we've, we mentioned this a couple of years ago in some sermons. But now things are starting to happen. Buildings are starting to go up. Ground is being shaken. And we're seeing these things happen. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is something called the East Village that's being developed. It's a 425-acre development in the Austin Northeast Technology Corridor. It's just off Palmer Lane. It's going to have office, retail space, housing, restaurants, hotels, grocery, you name it. It seems like it's going to have it. And just up the road on Palmer Lane, it's going to have easy access to I-35 and the 130 toll. Why? Because there's something called Tesla coming in to southeast Austin. Uh, it's a $10 billion Tesla plant that's going to bring in 20,000 new jobs and 100,000 new indirect jobs that will still serve that facility. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, Pastor Stephen, that's great and all, but that's not really our little area here of Cedar Park and Leander, is it? Maybe it's not close enough. Okay, let's get a little closer. How about the United Tennis Association, the Texas headquarters, coming in just right up the road in Cedar Park, Indigo Ridge, right across from Vista Ridge High School. A $1.5 billion development that's going to feature 40 hard, court, 40 hard courts, six to eight indoor courts, a stadium court, and then world-class amenities. You think that's going to bring some people in? Probably. It's pretty close. How about even closer, though, to us? There's something called the North Line Leander development going in less than eight minutes from here. Another 115-acre mixed-use project with office space and retail and hotel and, oh yeah, featuring parks, playscapes, and trails. You know, just back in 2020, Leander topped the U.S. Census list of fastest-growing large cities. And they're going to saying that this North Line development will become a hub for all of Williamson County. So imagine picking up the domain area and dropping it into Leander, Cedar Parkish. That's what we're talking about. There's also something called Leander Springs. Again, a less than 10 minutes from here. More retail, residential, entertainment. Oh yeah, not to mention this beautiful four-acre crystal clear lagoon with beaches. Right up the road. And then there's something that I feel like I could take a rock and throw and hit from where we are right now. And that's called the Bell District Project. Right over there. One block, maybe, from us. Again, much of the same. Space for business, space for entertainment, some housing. But the main thing that all these things are driving towards is community. Providing places for people to have community. I have no idea what's going through your mind right now. Probably traffic, right? 
Lots and lots of traffic. We have enough already. I get that. And maybe you're excited when you see these things coming in. We have a pickleball, whole pickleball court coming in uh, just up the road by Chick-fil-A. Perfect game, a baseball complex for our student athletes also coming into Cedar Park. The list goes on. This is just what I pulled from the internet to share with you today. That's what God is doing around us. And it's okay to be excited about that, but here's the real question. What are we going to take to them? How are we going to set ourselves up as a church to meet this great need of all the people that God are bring, is bringing into this area? First thing that comes to mind for me is, yeah, follow the stars, awesome. It's a whole new crop of hundreds of thousands of people who have never seen the gospel story. All new stories to come out of the production. It's why we're continuing to do this. It's going to be fun. It really is. But God is placing at our doorstep the greatest opportunity, I believe, in this church's history to reach people with this great news. News of forgiveness. So my point today is, what if we got curious? What if we were people of faith who are for our neighbors? And I'm not saying we're not right now. But what if we took it to the next level? What if we looked at what it means to really be missional in what we do to reach our community. You see, when people are faith are for our neighbors, God, he goes to work, he drives conversation, he allows us to use these big faith stories to connect with them, to share that hope. That's how God, he does it. He uses us. He intertwines all of our stories together, all this big faith, and he tells us to go and to share it. What a privilege that is to do together. So God, that is some of the opportunities that he's given us. But I want to share with you one thing. I was talking about our story here at Good Shepherd, right? About for two years now, this question of what if we got curious has been a topic of discussion at our board meetings. So much so that about a year and a half, two years ago, they actually said, let's develop a team. Guess what we named it? The development team, yeah? Yeah, really clever. And they started looking at how are we going to respond to all of this coming into our area. So we started looking at demographics. We started looking at all these projects. We started looking at the age range of people who are moving in, where they're coming from. And then we started to get curious. What can we do here? I want to show you a, a picture real quick. It's of the front of our church. It's what I'm calling our 1431 project. How many of you remember we did a project like this maybe six, seven years ago here at the church? We raised a 30-foot tall cross right outside, and it made a big difference for our community. It said, we are here, we're not moving, we're staying, and we are, want to share this message with you of grace. It's time to do it again. And so much so, because of the generosity of this congregation, there are members here who have already stepped up to say, I will fund this entire project. Because I want people to know Jesus. I want them to know the goodness of God. And yes, we're going to have to do this all together. We're going to be talking about this as a congregation. But this is an exciting opportunity to improve our curb appeal, to let people know we're here. There's a church behind the trees, right? And we want to be there with you. We want to do life with you. Here's something else that kind of came from some of you to uh, the board and to some of these members of the development team. He said, what if we got curious and we talked about maybe serving our community in a way that is not traditional in, in some ways? It, having a columbarium, a memorial garden at the back part of our campus, a place to inter ashes, right? You know, in Cedar Park and Leander, this greater area here, most of those places are already filled. <laughs> you have to be driving out to Pflugerville or Round Rock to find empty places to, to inter ashes, and so this is something, again, that's come from the congregation to us, and we've been looking at it. I'm not saying we're doing it. I'm just saying, what if we got curious? What if we talked about it? It's pretty, look, pretty nice looking, I think, right? So let's have that conversation together. Let's have the big faith to move forward, to have those conversations. But there's something else. 50 years of being at this church, of being in this community, 
Not once has this church ever had a building that was meant to be a sanctuary. What we sit in right now, it was a multi-use facility. It was meant to hold dinners when it was created, to have church in when it was created. And you can kind of see the renovations as we added amongst all the years that it's been. But what if we got curious? What if we got serious about what it would look like to have this entry to our church? A place, again, where you stepped in and you knew exactly what we were about. We're about raising up the next generation. We're about discipling our kids. We're about bringing people in to do life together and to share this message together. A a fellowship area, right? We don't have that right now. We have the community center, but we end church and we kind of park in different areas and then we go our separate ways. What if we had this grand entrance to our church that could serve as this? And oh yeah, also build a building to fit our needs here as a church, to say to this community again that we're here, to say to our youth that you matter, because you know what building that new building does? It frees up space for our youth to finally have a place here to call their own. I'm excited about that. I want to go through this with you, to go down this journey with you. I really, really do, to have these conversations. Again, I'm not saying that we have to do it, But I am saying that I believe that's where God's calling us. He's bringing all these people around us. How are we going to meet the need of everybody that he's bringing to this area? Something that we need to address together. And so we'll be hearing from that development team, from their findings, and hopefully moving together as a church into the future to meet this great need. We celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. And what better way to show our love and thankfulness than to step out in this big faith, to make plans that are exciting and bold for the next 50 years, to set up the next generation to do ministry together. We have to think about the generations to come here at Good Shepherd. Let's do it together. And let's have the big faith that God calls us to have as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you're doing in this area. And I just see it as such an incredible opportunity to reach the lost, to reach those who have never heard Jesus, to reach those who have heard about Jesus and maybe fallen away from their faith, to to do life with each other, to be a place of worship where people can come here every day of the week, God, to have activities going on every day of the week. It's not just a Wednesday place or a Sunday place, it's every day. Help give us the vision to accomplish that. Help give us the willing hearts, God, to have those conversations, to see how we can change, to become more and more mission-minded, God. Because that's what it's all about. It's about sharing this grace and this forgiveness that we've known. I thank you for the stories of the Bible through this series that have shown your faithfulness then. I thank you for all the stories that people opened up about in our, in our series and got to share today and how you're faithful now. But God, I know that you're going to be faithful going into the future as well. And so we lean on you and we put our eyes on you. We're watchful, we're thankful, and we're going to be prayerful as well.